The importance of prayer, I wanted to have you, the listening audience, turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings. And uh, we have some important lessons to learn there about the power of intercession. And to get our setting, I'd like to look in 1 Kings chapter 16, beginning with verse 29. If you'll get your Bibles out and follow along with me, verse 29 says, In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. So 22 years Ahab was ruling. I want you to notice what verse 30 says. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. This kind of gives us the setting. He not only considered trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel. And you remember somewhat of the story of Jezebel. And uh, continues on, he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel before him. So that's the setting. And that's the setting when Elijah comes along. And turning to chapter 17, continue with the story there, it says, Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab, he just shows up out of nowhere. And he confronts the king. He says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now what Ahab didn't know, and we wouldn't have known, apart from what we find in the book of James. If you have your Bibles, quickly turn over there to the book of James. And it talks about Elijah. And it talks about his confronting uh, Ahab in verse 17 of chapter 5. It says, Elijah was a man just like us, like you, like me. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. So when he shows up to Ahab, before he showed up, he's been praying. And he prayed that it wouldn't rain. And there in verse 1, it says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except to my word. In the story of Elijah, there's four different prayers. The first prayer has to do with drought, and we've just read about that where he confronts him. And what's so interesting, it says, Elijah was a man just like us. And there's a confrontation that takes place between Elijah and all the other uh, uh, all, all the other the followers of Baal. There's a, con a confrontation between the God of Israel and Baal. The first prayer was drought. The second prayer is for fire. Chapter 18, verse 1 is the follow-up. It's about three, three and a half years later. Chapter 18, verse 1, after a long time, in the third year, and James says it's three and a half years. In the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. And the second prayer has to do with fire. And there's this amazing story that takes place between uh, Ahab and Elijah and all the false prophets. So as, a, a, as uh, Elijah shows up over here in chapter 18, verse 16, it says, So Obadiah went to Ahab and told him, Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said, Is that you that trouble of Israel? Elijah says, I have not trouble for Israel, he replied, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed Baal. So here's the agreement he has. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? After the three and a half years of drought, they're still following Baal. And he says, If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people, they said nothing. Then Elijah said, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves. And let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Now notice the response of the people. Then all the people said, what you say is good. This sounds like a good deal. We will prove who is the real God. 
So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and prepared it. I am sure that Elijah was watching very carefully because if there's anything that the worshipers of Baal and these priests of Baal wanted to do was to set that thing on fire. So then they called on the Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they'd made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Verse 27, shout louder, he says. Surely he's God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping. He must be awakened up. So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears. Midday passed and they continued the frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So here's this great showdown taking place. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. First thing he did was set up the altar of the Lord. So Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes from Israel to of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come. Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two sealers of seed, probably about 13 quarts. Okay, when the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, large enough to hold two seals of his seed, he arranged the wood, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. On the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering. He wanted to make sure that there was no way that this could be taking place except by an answer, a direct answer to prayer. Do it a third time, he said, and they did it the third time. The water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, O God of Israel, of Abraham, of Isaac, and Israel. Let it be known today. Notice his prayer. Let it be known today that you are the God of Israel, and I'm your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back. Notice the prayer of Elijah. It's an intercession. This is about God's honor and glory that's at stake. Verse 38 says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stone, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Elijah, you remember the story here, commanded and seized the prophets of Baal. Don't let them get them away. They seized them. Elijah brought them down to Kishon Valley, and he slaughtered them there. So the second prayer was for fire. The third prayer was for rain. And still there in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41. Verse 41 says, And Elijah said to Ahab, Go and eat and drink, for there's sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, and Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, but bent down to the ground, and he put his face between his knees. Here is deep intercession. He's down on the ground, put his face between his knees. He says, go and look toward the sea. He's got this servant. Go and look toward the sea, he's told his servant, and he went and looked. Now, I want you to notice, God didn't immediately answer this prayer. God doesn't always immediately answer our prayers. But about this time tomorrow, well, he said, uh, go and check. I lost my place here. And <laughs> I'm reading there in verse, uh, verse 41. Yeah, verse 41. He tells his servant, go and toward the sea. And he, he told the servant, and he went and he looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. So God didn't immediately answer this prayer. And seven times he sent the servant. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go until they have hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. He knew that the answer was coming. Meanwhile, the sky grew gray with black clouds. The wind rose. A heavy rain came on. And Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah. And tucking his clothes in his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way. Now, Ahab tells Jezebel what's happening. 
and Jezebel threatens to take Ahab, uh, take Elijah's life. The fourth prayer we find here is about in despair. Notice what happens when he's fleeing from uh, Jezebel. He's had this great victory. 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse 3. Elijah was afraid. He ran for his life. When he came to Bathsheba and Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. He had this great victory, and yet despair set in. And he says, Lord, I have had enough. Take my life. I know better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once the angel touched him, said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him. Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days, 40 nights, until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went to a cave and spent the night. And once again, he encounters the Lord. Verse 9 says, And the Lord, word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He says, I've been very jealous for the Lord. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your oaths, put your prophets to death. I am the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord says, Go out, stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart and it entered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice came, came to Elijah, what are you doing here? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. And the Lord says, you know, I've got 7,000 others. You're not the only one. The Lord said to him, go back to, your, to the way you came, go back to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Abraham. And he says, I, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and all whose mouth have not kick, kissed him. Four prayers, four answers. What can we learn from Elijah? The prayers of Elijah were powerful, not because of the one that was praying, but because of the one that was answering. I want to say that again. The prayers of Elijah were powerful, not because of the one who was praying, but because of the one who was answering. What lessons can we learn? Effective prayer is not about us. Number one. His prayer was always, and the intercessions were always about bringing glory to God. Number two, effective prayer is grounded in God's will. And unfortunately, many times our prayers are grounded in our own will and has nothing to do with bringing honor and glory to God. And the third one, God hears and answers our prayers even when we're in despair and when we are discouraged. Three powerful lessons from Elijah. And I'd like to close this message by turning to a wonderful promise in the book of Ephesians. God is waiting to hear from us now. And Ephesians and the third chapter is a powerful promise for each one of us today. And it has to do with intercession. Verse 20 of chapter 3, Paul writes, Now to him... Who is able? I want you to know that we serve a God that is able. But notice what it says. Who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. He is able. And the lessons from Elijah are relevant for us today. James says he is a man just like us or a woman just like us, and we can learn from Elijah. When you can't see his hand, trust his heart. Thank you. I have entitled 
the, the word from God that I've been praying about for our time tonight, the moment before the miracle. And if there's anyone that's watching tonight that has been praying for a miracle, I want you to grab the word of God, grab a Bible nearby. And if you don't have one nearby, don't go too far. Just grab something that you can take note of or pay really close attention because this message is for you. There's a story of three friends, soul brothers, if you will, who were raised up with the right type of upbringing, the kind that made them so strong to stand up for what they believed was right, even when they were so far away from home and had to stand up even against the grain. And uh, their story in scripture is found in Daniel chapter 3. So if you're looking for a place to turn in scripture, you want to go to the book of Daniel chapter 3, or you can use your electronic devices and just type right in Daniel chapter 3, because I want you to see it for yourself. Daniel chapter 3 tells us of a story of these three guys. Their, name are Sh their names are Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, if you prefer their original Hebrew labels, Hananiah, Meshach, and Azariah, or you VeggieTale fans, Shaq, Rack, and Benny, I think it goes. So I'll accept either one. One thing, however, is for sure. These three friends fit a description that we can find in one of the most classic, powerful Ellen White quotes found in Education, page 57. It's so powerful, I don't even want to paraphrase it. I'm just going to read it. And it goes like this. The greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. In the name of Jesus, I pray that we would be these types of people, this type of person, have this character. But you know, it's really only by the grace of God that we would ever fit this description. And yet in the story of Daniel chapter 3 with these three guy friends, man, they really fit the description. So in case you're wondering what the story is about, I'll go ahead and read a little bit to you. But it basically starts with the king of the land putting up this huge image of gold, as many of you may know, but perhaps not all of you, so I will break a little bit of the details down. 60 cubits high, six cubits wide, which is basically 90 feet high and 90 feet and nine feet wide. Big deal. I made a law of the land decreeing that at any time when music was to be played, all the nations, every person of any language would have to fall down and bow and worship the king that set the image of gold up. That would be King Nebuchadnezzar. And here comes the threat. It's not just a call to worship, it's a threat. Daniel chapter three, verse six says, whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into blazing furnace. So this was a no small thing. When we find that in the story, these three guy friends decide we will not bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar or to anyone else but the one true God. And so they say in verse 16, and I'll read it again because they say it best themselves, recorded in scripture, Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king these powerful words, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. I'll just pause there. They were so confident, weren't they, that God will save them from the fiery furnace, from this threat to die by fire. Perhaps their confidence in the Lord came from the from their remembering that it was the hand of the Lord, not the hand of Pharaoh, that delivered the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, as recorded in Exodus chapter 13, verse 3. So they knew that because of what God had done in the past, they knew in the present what God could do for their future, that it would be the hand of God that would deliver them from the hand of their enemy. And yet, 
they don't stop there. What's the next verse? If you're following Daniel chapter 3, verse 18, they keep going. There's a conjunction. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, so many great theologians, far greater than I, have preached a sermon on this, these very words, because they're bold and they declare faith, right? Faith and integrity. But I'd like to propose that the biggest moment of faith for these three boys or young men was yet to come. Yes, their words were a declaration of faith and courage and confidence in the Lord, and it takes a saving relationship with God to say something like this against the grain and before the enemy. But I'd like to suggest that their moment of faith, their greatest moment of faith, was still awaiting them. Because words alone have nothing in comparison to words coupled with action, right? When you can speak faith and act in faith, now mountains are going to move. Now the moment before the miracle is occurring. And so I'd like to propose that it was actually in parabolic motion midair when these three boys were tied with full clothing, robes, turban, and all the other things they had on, even after declaring that their God would save them. But even if he didn't, they would still not bow down. And yet, even after that, they are thrown into the fire. Like, you would have thought that, wow, they stood up and they honored God with their words. Surely God's not going to let them be thrown in the fire. But they get thrown in the fire. It is in that moment when they are thrown, already midair, but not yet in the furnace. I believe if we could capture that moment, that would be a huge moment of faith, the moment before the miracle. You see, now their words were coupled with action, and they were quite helpless in that action. Now the circumstance they may have been praying against, Lord, you know, I believe in you. You're good. You're going to save us. No matter what, even if you don't, I'll still honor you. But, you know, to be honest, I really don't want to be thrown in the fiery furnace. So if you could help save me from being thrown into the flames. Have you ever prayed a prayer asking for a specific circumstance? Lord, I'd really like to get that job. I'd really like to get into this school. Lord, I'm really interested in starting a certain relationship. God, you know my family needs a car. You know we need a place to live a new place to live, whatever the circumstantial prayers that you may have been familiar with in your own life and walk with God, I think these three boys may have a, a intimate acquaintance with the feeling that human experience of not wanting bad things to happen to us, yeah. Well, certainly in that moment when they're in midair and there's no turning back, and they're headed towards the very circumstance that no one would ever wish for, going into a fiery furnace that their enemy had heated up seven times hotter than usual, that it actually killed the very guys who threw them in. Can you imagine being alive, but midair, helpless towards impending doom? Where will your faith be in that moment? Where will your faith, your courage, your integrity stand? in that moment, midair. For these men, we find that they were not being thrown into impending doom. They were being thrown by the hand of God into a great miracle. They were being thrown not just into the fiery furnace, they were being thrown into a revelation of a greater glory of God. And perhaps you who have gone through circumstances that doesn't seem like an answer to prayer that a good God will give. Maybe your very 
position where God has allowed you to be to wait in, maybe that is your moment before a greater revelation of God's glory. Not that God wishes bad things to happen, but that any time we go through a great battle, God promises even greater blessings. That which people meant for harm, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, we find in scripture affirming God will make out for good. And so um, I'm reminded of my own experience in these last few minutes we have together. I was waiting this time last year for a very important surgery that seemed to be postponed, postponed, and was being postponed to the point that my health was being affected, my job was being affected, and other aspects of my life. Paramedics were coming into my home. I was acquainted with the emergency room. My doctor had my personal number, and I had his. It was that type of relationship. And maybe you, too, who are watching, you're also acquainted with the hospital. Well, I had to face a moment before my own miracle in that situation. And I tell you what, the hardest moment to keep my faith alive was the moment between God speaking his promise over my life and me waiting for God to fulfill his word. It's that mid-air, mid-action waiting time when you feel helpless that faith counts the most. It's that moment right before the miracle when your faith matters the most. If you can stay true like the needle to the pole, even when you're mid-air, trust me from experience, but even more, trust the word of God recorded in scripture. You will be experiencing next a miracle because even if circumstances take place on this side of earth that don't really end up looking good, the universal picture and perspective of it all is that one day there will be the greatest miracle, the greatest revelation of God's glory. And that will come when Jesus returns to take us home and there will be no more pain, no more death, no more suffering. Just remember that your faith will be tested the most right before the greatest miracle. May God bless you because God did bless me too. And I pray the same for every viewer, every listener, and those you represent. I couldn't see how God was going to bless me. And on the same day that my mother fasted and prayed, my surgeon called me. My surgeon called me, which surgeon calls their patients, and asked me if he would be if I would be willing to allow him to perform the surgery I needed. And um, I switched my insurance from this other uh, place that I was supposed to be at and told the previous surgeon that I would be no longer waiting for a postponed date, that a surgeon from the hand of God had come my way. And sure enough, the surgery went successful and I'm standing before you today as a living testimony that God the one who tests our faith, the one who sometimes allows the righteous to be thrown into the fire is also the God who brings about great miracles. May God bless you.